last class I was ta talking about, um, we started talking a little bit about machine learning, and we <coughs> talked about a couple of different approaches to machine learning. We talked about decision trees. We talked about boosting. We talked about things like that. I want to talk about a couple of well, not com necessarily completely related topics in machine learning, but just to kind of finish covering what, uh, what I think are, are interesting things. Um, and in particular, what I want to talk about is, I guess, naive Bayes classification. I want to talk about some issues related to that, about um, organizing features. And then I want to talk a tiny bit about deep learning and some related things about that. Any questions about where we are? OK. So we are often faced with, um, in doing classification, a world where we have uh, a large number of what I will call very weak features. Um, you know, an example of this that I would say are in text classification. Let's say you, you consider the world of trying to build a spam filter to tell whether an, an input document is spam or not. What are your logical features? The usual word, uh, you know, the usual features for that would be for each vocabulary word, how many times was it mentioned in the email? What is a word that probably does not appear very often in spam? Can anyone give me a guess? A word that appears probably more often in real mail than spam. Does anybody have a guess? There's presumably hundreds of thousands of them. That's why they're weak features. But does anyone, you know, what would be an, an idea of a word that probably is more likely to appear in real mail than spam? Lucky? Lucky, I bet you, appears more in spam then unlucky. This is your lucky day. I have sent you the spam, right? Are there words that are so lucky, sale? What, what, what words are to come? What words are likely more likely in spam? People have ideas of open now. What? One. W O N. Okay. Lottery. Money. Maybe. Okay. What would be one that probably appears more in uh, regular email than than spam? What? Sincerely? OK, perhaps I was going to say lunch, something like that. We can kind of imagine there are you know, 50,000 words in the vocabulary of, let's say, typical people, 50, 100,000, whatever it is. Certain words would occur more often than other words okay, in a certain class of documents. Now, you wouldn't want to, you could imagine building a classifier where you would like to take a look at, count how many times the word um, uh, sincerely appeared in the document, okay? And if it's more often than usually, if, it's, if, it occur, if it occurs with a frequency more consistent with examples of real emails than examples of um, spam, that would be a vote that it's probably a real email, right? And if you see the word lucky, okay, or a one, okay, with frequencies more often than in spam, that would be a vote for, um, you know, for uh, you know, for it being spam. Now the problem, of course, is here you have a world where you've got several thousand different features. I said fifty thousand vocabulary words, and each of them probably it's a, a, you know, certain words are probably two times overrepresented in spam, three times, five times. Okay, these are still relatively weak features. And we are faced with the problem of how do you combine a large number of weak features to build a classifier. Any questions about that? This was one of the things that was addressed with a little by boosting. We talked about boosting last time, the idea that maybe you would figure out which features do you weigh more heavily by that. But even so, that's when you have too many of these possible features, boosting turns out to be kind of a, a weak and complicated way to do it. So a um, class, a very simple but powerful class of um, sort of cl class decision procedures or classifiers are based on Bayes' law. Okay, so suppose we are faced with the problem where we have a feature vector of n dimensions, and we want to take this feature vector and determine which class it should be in. You have examples of m classes. Okay. You want to classify this feature vector into one of those M classes. How could we do it? 
What we're really interested in is, for this feature vector, what is the probability of it being in class I, given the contents of this feature vector, right? And one way that you can compute this thing is by using Bayes' law. Bayes' law, if you go back to this thing, would say that the probability of it being in class I, given the evidence, given the vector, is the probability of something being in class I independent of any feature, without looking at the features, times the probability of the features given that it's in class I divided by the probability of the features. Okay? And this is what Bayes' law would tell you how to do. Okay? Now, if we try to parse this, let's think about it. What does the, why do we have this thing on the probability of class I independent of the vector? What is that? This is our prior knowledge of the distribution, right? If I want to classify you guys by nationality, I know that there are more Chinese, and I know there are more Indian, and there are people from Malta, okay? And that therefore, you know, if you want me to say, what's the probability of someone being from Malta giving the evidence? It is helpful to know that there are not that many people from Malta. Is that correct? Okay, so that's the prior. That's obvious. The denominator is a kind of weird thing. What's the probability of the feature vector, okay, overall in the entire world, okay? So if you think about it, if I have a document and I don't know anything about it, and I see that the words dog, cat, mouse, this occurred five times, three times, one times, zero, zero, one, seven, six. What is the probability that this feature vector existed? Okay? And this seems like a weird thing to try to contemplate. Okay? Perhaps if I knew something about, uh, you know, I could say in my corpus of documents, how often did that feature vector occur? But by definition, in a feature, the, the space of all possible feature vectors is huge. The um, number of documents you have is not that huge, right? So if I give you any possible feature vector, what's the likelihood it occurred in your training examples of every possible feature vector? You say one by n. I say almost zero by, a, by, by an end, okay? If you think about the space of all possible feature vectors, okay, it's, it's hard to believe that anybody has that properties. If you come up with any properties for any record, for any kind of a thing, you know, if I take you, a combination of you, a people, by, if I, there's a height, there's a weight, there's a foot, left foot size, there's a right foot size, there's a, you give me a long vector of these things. If I put down numbers for this, how many people in the world have exactly those numbers? Almost certainly nobody, okay? So this is kind of a weird thing. Notice that, that we're asking for what is the probability of the input vector? And this seems like a weird thing to compute. Is that clear? Slightly less weird is what is the probability of the input vector given the class? And maybe now, this is, I think, a little bit less weird. It'd sort of be, what's the probability I got this word distribution given that it was spam? Now that I know it's spam, well, that simplifies things to a little bit. But still, I have the same kind of problem that that's kind of a weird thing. Any questions? Yeah. Is it susceptible to false positive? Every classification is susceptible to false positive. Well, if your prior distribution, and the way I would think about it, if you're relying on a prior distribution, if your prior distributional assumption is wrong, it can do very bad things, right? So if, let's say, I'm assuming that this is a world, you know, the, 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 my, a prior distribution that there are three billion, a billion Chinese and a billion Indians and 50,000 people from, the, you know, from um, Malta, if I now say, what's the probability of persons from Malta, you know, and, and I happen to do this experiment in Malta, my uh, prior distribution is wrong. 
right? So the important thing is to get your prior distribution right, okay? You hope that your knowledge about the world is reflecting what examples you're seeing. And if you're, you know, if you get that wrong, that, that will make it more like, you know, a pos you know that, that will obviously decrease the accuracy of it. Yeah? Well, P of X should be roughly equal to zero. Okay, so this is this looks bad, right? First of all, something being ne dividing by near zero does not make it infinite. It makes it big, okay? And making it by dividing it by zero makes it infinite. So how are we going to solve this problem? Well, first, this problem about the input turns out to be a, a red herring. It's not something we really worry. We want to build a classifier that is going to pick the class that maximizes this probability. Now, wh when we run it over all possible classes that we could be ascribing a label to. Now, notice that the denominator here is independent of M, of I. Okay, it's independent of what class you're using. So what does that mean? That means that this is a constant that we're multiplying this by. And if we, our goal is to find which is the class that maximizes this quantity, we don't need to know that constant in order to do it. Does everybody kind of see that? So one problem that's nice is we can get rid of that messy thing. OK? And now we've got the, uh, a, a formula that looks something like this. The probability of, of, a, of this being in a particular class is going to be a class i. The probability of it being in class i is going to be the prior probability of class i times the probability of being class i giving our evidence. Now, we still don't know how to compute this, though. This is still a messy computation. What's the probability of the data given that we know what class it's in? OK, any questions? Well, here we're going to um, use make an assumption. Typically, in an input vector, You've got, you know, if it's an input vector of dim n dimensions, you've got n different variables. Let's say that uh, I wanted to try to figure out what's the probability of you being 5'8", somebody being 5'8", weighing 120 pounds, being male, and having a shoe size of 8. What's the probability of that? It seems complicated. But if I have enough examples, and I assume independence of things, I claim it's relatively, you know, I can make a, make a stab at this. What is the problem? How would I figure out what's the probability someone is five foot eight? Okay. I look at all the people in the world or my universe or my class, to be precise, my particular, you know, you know category here, and say what fraction of them are five eight? Okay. And that would give me an estimate of what's the, pro 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 the uh, probability they're five eight. What's the probability they weigh 120 pounds? How would I figure that out? Same kind of thing, right? Now, what's the probability that they weigh 125 pounds and are 5'8"? What? So there's two different ways to do it, one right and one wrong. And we're going to be interested in the wrong one. The right way to do it, it would seem, would be, why don't we just count out of all the people in the world, how many of them weigh 120 pounds and are 5'8"? OK, what's wrong with that? Or what's a problem with that? Because they're such a tiny square board, like, who are 5'8", and they're in the same thing. So subtract the intersection with them. Like well, you're saying subtract the intersection. You're saying if there's correlation, that's a sign that if I could count up from the examples how many have this property, that's actually a good thing, right? What's wrong? How would I estimate what's the, what's the probability that someone is going to be both 5'8 and 120 pounds? OK, I could look at my data. What's going to be the problem with this? Well, the problem is I clearly need more data to get an accurate estimation of this joint probability than I did of any individual thing. Is that right? That, 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 that it's true that, there are, that, that if I have a big enough data set, I will have some people who are 120 pounds and um, what do you call it, and 5'8", uh, and maybe I can figure them out. But now let's say I add a third variable here, shoe size. 
And I say, how many of these people have a shoe size of 10? It should be clear that the more properties I seek to measure in this joint probability, the fewer examples I will see. Does everybody kind of get that? And that you felt you could trust how many people, what fraction of the world weighs 120 pounds, because you felt, I, oh, there's a lot of people and there's not that many different weights. But when I have a complex joint distribution, it is very unlikely I will see enough examples to be able to estimate this over all that. Is that kind of clear? Yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, if you're counting on seeing people, let's take a look at this thing. How many people in the world, let's take a look, let's say we could sample everyone in the world. How many people in the world have a weight of 120 pounds? You know, I'm going to take a guess, there's 3 billion people. How many of them have it? I'd say a hundredth of that. Probably one out of every hundred people weighs 120 pounds. That gives me how many? 30 million? No, is that right? 30 million after I've done 100? Now, how many of these people weigh 120 pounds, uh, have a height of 5'8"? Maybe 20% of them or 30, let, let, let's, no, not 20% of them, maybe 1 out of 10 of them. Now that leaves me 30, what was it? 3 million. Okay, that's, all right, that's 3 million, that's still not bad. How many of them have a shoe size of 10? 1 out of every 100, lope off some more zeros. Do you see that as I add more and more specifications, the number is going to drop? So even if I have 3 billion training examples, okay, if you ask me to estimate a complex joint probability distribution, okay, I can't do it because th there isn't enough data to sort of bin it like that. Does everybody kind of see that? Okay, and you keep going, and eventually, after enough boxes, your probability is going to be zero. Okay. Do you agree? Your observed count is going to be zero. But it would be a replacement that I get. And recognize that if you have a complex feature vector, the odds that you have seen this long feature vector before in your training is zero, okay, or near zero, right? So that's kind of the problem. We can't estimate it precisely because there isn't enough training data. Any questions? Now, what is an easier way to do it, OK? What we could do is assume that the features are independent, OK? And if the features are independent, you had no hesitation of believing we could figure out what's the probability that someone weighs 120 pounds. And you felt that there was no, um, nothing wrong with uh, assuming the probability that someone was 5 foot 8 inches, right? The probability that someone is both A and B, if there was independence, would be the probability of A times the probability of B. And does everybody see that if, every, if all these features were independent, we could come up with an estimation for what is the, um, what you call it, the probability of a long vector, okay, by simply multiplying the probabilities of each individual feature. Any questions about that? Okay, so the good thing about doing this is that, um, what do you call it, that, that um, you know, it's very easy to calculate for any, you know, assuming I can get basic distributions on each of my individual features, which doesn't seem like an unreasonable request, I can now get an estimate of probabilities of complicated conjunctions of these features. Okay, what's the problem with that? The problem is, of course, the probabilities aren't quite right. What is the probability that my, let's say, what's the probability that someone on their left foot has a, probab, has a shoe of size 9? I have a size, size 9 shoe, okay? 1 out of 13. What's the probability that someone has a right foot that is of size 9? 1 out of 13. What's the probability that someone has both feet of size 13? Size nine. What's the probability that you have both feet of size nine? It's presumably very close to one over 13, 
a lot closer to 1 over 13 than it is 1 over 13 times 1 over 13, right? Because your left foot size is very well correlated with your right foot size. Does everybody kind of see that? So the good news is we can estimate this easily. The bad news is um, it's not always right. The good news is if we have enough of these features, we know we can't do it right. And so maybe we will, we will live comfortably doing it wrong. Any questions? That is the philosophy of the naive Bayes algorithm. OK? So what is the naive Bayes algorithm going to do? We seek to find the argmax, meaning the class. I couldn't typeset argmax because of the, the, the broken way I had to do this. So I said max. We want to know what is the class i such that we maximize the probability of the prior of that class times the class given that error. I think that's called the posterior probability. And what we would say is, this is independent. We can factor that out. The probability of x vector, given that, is the probability over all the features of each individual feature given that class. This was the residual thing that we multiplied, right? Here we were assuming independence. And this is now obviously computable. OK? Any questions? And it is even better computable, more computable, if we take the log of this thing. Why would we want to take the log of this thing instead of um, solve, multiplying it like it is? Numerical precision, OK? When you multiply the probability of this times the probability of this times the probability of this times the probability of that, you will quickly get to 0, right? When you sum up the logs, you will gradually get to a more and more negative number, but one that isn't going to frighten anybody. Is that right? Wait, wait, what are we doing here? We're trying to maximize the probability of something in the class i. No, we're trying to seek the class i that has the maximum value of this. OK? Does everybody kind of get that idea? We want to know which class maximizes the product of the probability of, of this, the prior probability of this class, if we knew no evidence, times the product of, for every feature we have, the probability of seeing that feature given the class. OK? Any questions? Right, and then what we're going to do is we're going to run this thing to predict. I have a new vector x. How will I figure out what it's, um, what 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 class to give it? Yeah. I will compute this with the probabilities of each feature for each class. I will be computing this for each of the m classes and take the class that maximizes this probability. So the training time for this is like nothing. The training time for this is, I'll say, almost like nothing. What is the training time for this thing? The training time is for computing these residual values, right? You've got to look at your data and say, for all people in my training data of type class i, what was the distribution of feet, of, of height? What was the distribution of weight? What was the distribution of gender? Whatever else I had. Is that clear? So really, the training time here is only the computation of these residuals. And so in that sense, it's like nothing. Any questions about that? OK? Any questions about this, this idea OK? of how, why and how this works? So this has the property of being very simple. You can apply it to a high dimensional thing, OK? And you can build a nice classifier from it. Any questions about that? OK, good. There is one problem that sort of came up here in this discussion that is kind of an important thing, which is if you're determining, let's say, again, typically I, I think of these naive Bayes things as being applied to word class, text classification problems, although presumably you can do it for you know, anything that has a feature vector. But how many of you have ever seen the word defenestrate? In, well, OK, who, what does defenestrate mean? Very good. How do you know that? OK, OK. It's my favorite word. OK, so I've taught you this word, right? Before we got there, there was no defenestrate. Now there is, but, but recognize that there are rare words you have never heard of, right? And if you, um, 
what you call it, if you're trying to build a model to predict what's the likelihood of a document being spam or not, one thing you've got to worry about are what about words you haven't seen before? Okay? If you think about it, here we had a probability of what's the probability of someone being this height, this weight, this gender, this shoe size, this hair color. Okay? We may not have seen one in the training set. Does everybody agree? Is that what should the probability of having seen a per of a person like that be existing is? It shouldn't be zero. This is kind of the important point, I guess I want to say. Unseen things, the probability of a thing you haven't seen before is not zero. Okay, this is a common logical fallacy people make, right? There were a lot of people moaning that, oh, we couldn't possibly elect Trump because we've never elected a president who was a, uh, and you could list all sorts of unsavory adjectives, right? But why did that argument not hold weight? Well, there haven't been that many presidential elections, right? And even if there had been, there's no reason why a new thing can't happen that you haven't seen before, okay? The mathematician Laplace asked, what's the probability the sun will rise tomorrow? Okay? What is the probability? You say one, the answer is no. Okay? Because someday, do we believe the sun will always rise? Okay? The sun will not always rise. If the sun will not always rise, then the probability is zero. Is there going to be a supernova someday? Yes. Is it going to be... Tomorrow? Probably not, okay? But it's not zero. Do you kind of see what the problem is? Yes? So the problem is not having enough for their complete information. Maybe you don't have the complete set of things to develop. Part of it is that any training set is finite, okay? And any train, anything you build based on sampling is incomplete, okay? Is that kind of clear? Okay, if you absolutely could swear that you'd seen every possible thing that can ever happen, then maybe you know something about probabilities being zero, right? But otherwise, you don't have this. And this is a big problem in um, classification systems that if they don't properly think of what, how, how to deal with rare probabilities. Is this right? If you turn a rare probability of something you've never seen before into zero, let's think about it. Defenestrate, is it more likely to appear in spam or in regular mail? Regular. Say regular. You think spam, okay? Okay, let's say, let's say you say it won't come in either. And the truth is, what would you imagine? Let's think about a classifier that said, came along in one of your training examples of real mail. You got me threatening to defenestrate you, okay? And in the spam, you didn't have any such mention. Now, if you saw a document labeled that had the word defenestrate, what's the probability that it's a real, that, it, that, that it's a, a, a piece of spam? You would argue zero. But that's got to be a wrong thing. Does everybody see that that's a dangerous thing? Because what happens when you multiply a probability of zero times any other evidence you have? Zero, okay? And you say that with confidence, but you see that that's a problem here. You're going to make the entire decision of whether this is spam or not based on the one stray occurrence of the word defenestrate. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Doesn't that contradict our initial assumption that we are able to tell something is spam or not by looking at the frequency of certain words? So Does, that do, do, doesn't that mean we can't, does that mean we can't build a good spam classifier? No, it means that anybody who's deciding something is, ba is spam based on the word defenestrate should be defenestrated. <laughs> Isn't that right? But the idea of spam itself is subjective, right? It is not something that can be objectively detected. So if, if some word is, like you define spam by a selection of words, right? If something was never there, then it is not spam. Like, I mean, how, how would you know when... No, no, no. Recognize that, that, that there is a preponderance. You want your classifier to be about a preponderance of evidence, right? That there are a lot of things that they talk about in spam. And I have sent letters that probably contain a lot of these things, right? But there's, you know, the question, you, you base, want to base evidence, base a decision, a classification decision on the preponderance of evidence. 
And you want to make sure that if you're using any feature as a real thumb on the scale that says, this is enough to make my, my decision, you wouldn't want it to be a rare feature okay, that occurred once in a training set. Does everybody see that? So one possibility is say, oh, maybe we should delete all rare features. But of course, there's a power law thing, and there's a large number of rare features. And where does it stop being rare? OK? What I claim is that we need an accurate way to estimate probabilities of low frequency events. This is, I think, the important thing to come away with, OK? That the probability of something you have not seen is not zero. This is an important lesson. Think about it with the sunrise tomorrow. When it comes up, you say, good, OK? Not knew it all the time, OK? But, 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 but be grateful for it, right? And we need a way to estimate probability of low frequency events. Any questions about that? Because this is the, the kind of dumb thing that messes up large numbers of classifiers. Any questions? Well, OK, I'm not, you know, when you say lots of different problems, you have the training set you have, OK? And in this case, the fenestrate appeared in one piece of spam. That's what we had, OK? Any questions? Would Laplace really act the same as the Laplace Well, Laplace, the only reason I put his name on, on the slide was because of the Laplace transform. If it was Rabinowitz or someone you'd never heard of, I wouldn't have put his name. But you can see the question is, the important, is an important question. What is the probability of low frequency events? Oh, you said the gap, yeah. it, yes, as far as I know, he didn't, he didn't tell it to me, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but as I understand, he asked that. Okay, how might I deal with this? So there is an important technique, statistical technique, called discounting. What you would like to do is, when you take a look at the frequencies of things, you, you, you need to ascribe some probability space to things that you haven't seen. Does everybody kind of get that idea? OK, just because I haven't seen, um, you know, uh, what you call it, uh, the fenestrate in spam does not mean it can't ever occur. It means I've seen a small sample. And that if I, the presumption is if I saw and sampled more and more and more, I will see things I haven't seen yet. Is that correct? So the simplest, let's say, and, and again, doing exactly how you discount properly in all cases is a subtle statistical thing. That said, the you know, sort of standard idea that people use is something called add one discounting, where what they basically do is if you have a um, frequency table of outcomes, you add one to the frequency of all um, outcomes including the unseen one. So let's say that I'm sampling, I have marbles that I'm sampling from an urn. You've seen this kind of thing, right? You pull in there, I pulled out a red one. I pulled out a green one. I pulled out a red one. I pulled out a red one. I pulled out a green one. If I've since pulled out five reds and three greens, what's the probability I will see another color that I haven't seen yet, OK? If you were thinking like, you know, before, you might have said, oh, well, zero. I haven't seen any. They can't, they can't exist, OK? A more conservative idea, you want to leave some probability for it to occur, right? So what you do is you now say there's red, greens, and there's other. And add one to the probability, to the frequency count of all three items. Well, there's red. you add one to the reds, one to the greens, and one to the others. OK? So what does this do? Well, let's think. Well, let's first think, what does it do? OK? Before, we had five reds. Um, in calculator, probably, we assume we had five reds and three greens. Now we're going to assume we have six reds, four greens, and one other. OK? Now, what's the intuition, you say? OK? Now, what if, let's say, I have a large number of, l l OK, so. Would, would the new, 
We're adding one, an equal amount of occurrences to all of these things. Now, notice that just adding, if we just add one to the unknown class, okay, then um, the bias that that has, okay, let, let's think what the effect of it is. And again, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, this is a little, maybe a little counterintuitive, but this is, let's think what this actually does. If we have, well, what would you like to do? Let's think a little bit about what, what you would propose to do in a long word vector case. Let's take a look at this. These are the 50,000 most frequently used words in English. We've seen them in spam. A lot of them are going to be zeros. Some of them are going to be a lot more, right? They have high frequency words, some low frequency words. What would you do to deal with this? I am proposing that you add one to all the classes, okay, that you haven't seen, whether you've seen them or not, okay? That's kind of what I'm proposing. Now, let's think what the implication of this is. If we, what if we have a large number, a small number of classes with a large number of, um, what you call it? If we have a small, a small number of classes where there were a large number of elements in it, does everybody see that adding one to each class has a very small effect on the probability of these things? Is that right? but does give me some probability for the unknown. Does everybody see that? What if I had a lot of classes with very few samples? Let's say that I had n classes, each of which I'd seen once. What would happen if I just took the unknown and added one to it, which is what you're, I think, saying is the right idea. If I just add mass to the one that I didn't know, notice this one has really caught up with all the examined things, right? If I add one to each, each of these has the effect of getting boosted up, right? So they do, you know, they, you know, so they also gain. You can't win by just getting your the discounting. Okay? The thing that isn't observed should be rarer than anything that's been observed. Is that clear? And adding one has the property that does that. Okay? We can argue why is it one and should it be a fraction and there's a complicated literature on this and I've seen a, somebody say it should be 0.4 and all this kind of stuff. Okay? But bottom line is as a quick and dirty idea of what this should be. Okay? Adding one to the frequency counts Give, solves the problem of giving some weight to things we haven't seen, and also, um, what you call it, uh, not, not punishing, okay, things that we, we, we have seen, okay? Yeah. Sir, they can use multiple unknown new class for it, right? Blue, yeah. or pink, whatever. Yeah. You have just used one class as unknown, right? Right. So with, in a world where I don't know anything about the number of classes, how many should I class, new classes should I assume? Should I make an enumeration of all the colors? They could be color, marble could be orange, it could be magenta, it could be yellow, it could be brown. I could come up with this infinite number of colors, right? And then that becomes a silly question, right? Here my class, I had an other class. It's always good to have an other that you haven't seen or known about before. That's kind of what my class here is. It's not, not a color, it's that there be a new color. Okay? Now, in the case of the word vector thing, it's quite likely that many words will be in the defenestrate class that you've never seen them, right? But if you've defined them in the vocabulary, but not seen them in your sample, Again, what, would we, what words are there in English? You would say, well, there's all the words in English. I can do that by analyzing a big corpora. Google can, from Google, you can get the frequency of every word in English, right? Now, if in your small training set, you haven't seen defenestrate, that's fine. But we do know that that's a word, right? 
So it might be fair to define my bit vector to include all possible words, whether they were, I know my classes of words, right? I would probably want to still have one class of other, unknown, because any enumeration of words is going to be finite, right? And they're always making new words, and there's something someone forgot, right? So I would probably want to leave some space for other, but it would make sense for me to have classes that I might have seen. No, if I know the class exists, but I haven't seen it in my training data, I should have it set out here originally. Okay, there's a question of whether or not you have a complete enumeration of classes or not. Okay? And what I'm going to argue is you should never assume there is a complete enumeration of classes. Okay? Because there's always something new to be seen. And this gives you a way to estimate what the probability of what you haven't seen is. Any questions? Okay? So when you're, this is, an, this is kind of an important thing. It's, it's very easy to make a classifier do an incredibly dumb thing by treating low data events as having it wildly more significance than they need to. Because if you haven't seen something, you, you would otherwise think its probability is zero. Any questions about that? Yeah. So, uh, you're saying that there's something that's for real time to be real space. Yes. If you are getting um, data from a source, again, recognize that if, if you're saying, are there, how many genders are there? Okay. You wave your hand like you know. How many? So you say two. Okay, I always thought there were two. But somehow the world seems to have gotten more complicated in some ways. Is that right? Okay. Now what happened if you had a program that said, you know, you know, that was classifying basically under this thing. You eventually you saw some examples of classes that you didn't think existed before, right? So if you're in a world where you absolutely know there's a finite set of classes, then this doesn't isn't so important, right? But in many situations, you don't know this as much as you think you know it. And if so, being able to do some comp some discounting is a good thing. Okay? Any questions? Okay, good. Any questions about discounting? Okay, good. So discounting is, in my mind, gets us back to something I talked about, spent more time talking about at the beginning of the semester, but I think is really important, is that when you're building some kind of models, the feature engineering you do on your features is an important thing. You know, we talk about these machine learning algorithms, and everyone gets excited because those things sound interesting. The boring things like how do you deal with probabilities near zero, okay? How do you normalize your variables? What about missing va data values? How do you deal with that? When you, you know, how do you um, deal with uh, features like ratios and, and products? Remember we talked like, let's say, in, 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 in pricing a house, you'd want to know that area is an important thing, not just length and width. Because area is a, is, a, is a concept that is important in pricing things, okay, that you couldn't compute in a linear way from just uh, height and width. Does everybody see that? So having features, building features that do things that you, you, you know, that, that you know are important, complex features that you know are kind of important, meaningful ratios and things like that, these are important to build good features, and that's kind of... Uh, you know, I guess the, 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 the pitch I want to make. Any questions? Okay. And to make that clear one last time, I wanted to show one example from uh, the book, which I want people just to think through. Because again, I think that with a lot of these modeling problems, a lot of the sins people commit are at the feature level. Okay? So you may remember last time that in, in my, uh, when I did my the TV programs at the beginning of the semester, there was one about predicting price of paintings at auctions, right? And you wanted to build a model that took properties of the painting 
and predicted what was the price it was going to sell at the auction. You know, the guy yells, 33 million pounds sold. Kunk. Right? You want to predict that. Okay? Now, what's true about an auction house is that you pay, when you buy the painting, you pay the buyer the hammer price, clunk, and you also pay them the, 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 the house that sold it, the um, auction house, a percentage fee on what you, uh, on, on, on what you uh, did. Okay? So if you went to an auction house, do we think that the, the so, so maybe you would pay, a t if you go to Southby's, maybe you'll pay 10% of the auction, of the price of the painting as an extra fee to the house for, for doing the sale. Any questions about what I mean by this? Okay. Do we think that the, the price of the, the auction house, the percentage of fee, is going to have an impact on how much someone will bid for the painting? You say no. Suppose we go to a pri an auction house. One auction house <coughs> has a fee of 10%. So you will pay 110% of the hammer price, right? Let's say you go to my auction house, where you pay a fee of 50%. I like that better, right? Now you will pay 150% of the hammer price. If it's something you want, it's not a question. It's not just a question of, of how much it costs. It's can you get it at the price you want to get? So Sotheby's has a okay. Picasso, but your auction has only. But again, so it, it, the question is this: If I want to predict, here's my Picasso. I want to buy this Picasso, <laughs> right? How much am I? Go is this Picasso going to sell for? Do we believe this is independent of the the the? Um, what you call it. We're trying to pick how much the 100% price is. Do we think that the price someone will pay for that painting is independent of the commission to the sales house? Like if we assume that the commission is a very small fraction of the actual amount, then that should be... You're saying if, if it's a small amount, it is a part of the... it, it is to be ignored. Yeah. Okay, how small is small? 1% or less. 1% or less, I will say it's at least 10% and it varies by house. Yes. They will probably adjust the commission depending on the probability of it getting sold or whether it is sold or bad. No, no, this is a question of what kind of a store you shop in. You shop at Walmart, what's the commission, the amount you're paying to the house? Very little. You shop on Fifth Avenue. You buy the same, you go, go and you buy the same generic can of beans on, on Fifth Avenue. How much are you going to pay to the house for it? A lot more. Does everybody see that? So, so what, I guess what I'm, I'm not making, I guess, my point, okay? If I wanted to try to predict the price of the painting was going to sell for, what they were going to have when they banged the hammer, should I have the auction house percentage as a, the commission be part of the features for predicting the price of the painting? Yes. You will say yes. Does everybody see the answer I wanted was yes? I think that should be obvious, right? People say that whether you'll buy something depends upon the tax rate, right? They're always saying if we cut the sales tax, people will buy more. Why is that? Because it should matter. So how should we incorporate? If you were building something that was going to try to predict the hammer price of a painting, how would you incorporate the, the commission as a feature? Suppose the commission was 10%. We could have a column that would have the you know 10 in there or 0.1 for the percentage, right? And you buy it at, at Walmart, it was a 10%. You buy it on Fifth Avenue, it was 50%. That'd be one way you could represent it. Another way would be to represent the actual commission that was paid. Remember, you're training this as, as data, right? The other thing you could say, the painting sold for $1 million. Therefore, the commission was 100000 Could that be, that be a, a feature we had? OK? Or we could change the target variable instead of being to try to predict the hammer price to try to predict the total amount that is paid. Do people see what I mean by these three variants? It's funny, I wanted this to be exciting. I can help people are not as into this as I think. Which is a good or bad way to incorporate this into the model?
you think one or two is better. What is wrong with, let's say we're going to build a linear regression or something like that on having 10% as a feature? No, 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 but let's say that we have paintings. I'm picturing here we have one painting. This one sold at a commission of 10%. This one sold at a commission of 20%. This sold at a commission of 45 This sold this 10 No, no, no. Well, all the ones at Sotheby's might have sold, but this might have been at Sotheby's, Sotheby's, but these weren't, right? Is this representing it as a percentage, a good feature? For the price of a painting. You don't tell you how much it is, actually. If you're trying to predict if one of these paintings was by Picasso and sold for you know ten million, and one of these was by Skeena and it sold for a dollar fifty. <laughs> right? Do you see that in a linear regression model this way? It's you know the contribution of the commission is here, it should be very large, and here should be very small. And you see how you can't pick that up from the model? What about the second approach? That we, instead of putting this down, say this painting sold for $10 million, the commission was this, write 1 million as a feature vector. Could we put the actual commission in there? That you think would be good. What's bad about that? Well, the paintings would be of different values. What would be the commission paid on Skinas? 20% of this would be what? I think that that's, that's about 37 cents or something like that, right? But what's wrong with this? Something very obviously wrong with this. Well, maybe. I guess the bigger thing that I would say is that this is cheating. Why? If I knew that the commission paid on a uh, painting was $1 million, I can correctly calculate what the target price was. Does everybody see that? This is information you have after the thing was sold, right? Does everybody see that? So this would be cheating because that's information you would have afterwards. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. The third way of doing it, which was to have, instead of have predicting what was the auction price chunk, predict what would the guy actually have to pay when they walked out of the store, which was what they bid and the commission and any sales taxes or whatever else had to happen. Is that right? And this, I think, clearly now is the right way to do it. Does everybody see that? So in this case, again, it's just a, a, a cautionary tale that, that how you incorporate the knowledge, where it's a feature and how you do it, makes a big difference. Yeah, so what we would be doing is putting the, it into the target. This then shouldn't be a feature, right? Okay, and it's a question here of making the right target. And this kind of engineering is kind of an important thing to do. Yeah. The first one has the honor of being honest, but impossible to take advantage of. The second one has the property of being wildly dishonest and is using future data to predict current events. Which would I use? Said that way, which is better? Well, the first one of doing no harm is better, right? So this is fooling you completely. This is doing no harm, okay? But gain, doing nothing good, okay? So I would say the first one's much better, okay? But I think the third one is far best of all. Any questions? Yeah, that was the problem with the second one, was you're trying to derive from something you're trying to predict. And also, to a certain extent, 
uh, the fact that there's that feedback between, right, the commission rate and the actual target thing, that's kind of where I guess the problem is occurring here. Okay? But anyway, be careful with your features. That was the real point I wanted to make. Any questions? Okay. I want to say a small bit about deep learning. Okay? Everybody here has heard about deep learning these days. Everybody, know, I, I assume everybody's heard about deep learning, and this is this is the, the place where it's at. This is the hot stuff these days. And it's based on these ideas of building neural networks, okay? That seemingly what you would like to do is to, you have a set of input features, just like we've talked about before. You have a desired, let's say, regression value you want to compute, which is what we have here. And in a neural network model, what you do is you compute it by having a bunch of cells typically arranged in layers, where each cell takes a certain subset of inputs to it and produces an output that it gives to a certain cell's number of cells on the outside. And so in the idea of such a network is it to compute the regression value. We plug in input values here. It computes each one of these edges has a strength associated with it, a weight, okay? We compute what is basically some function of a linear sum, weighted sum of all the inputs here, and pass that on to the other layer. Okay, and this is what these neural networks do. Any questions? The difference between a deep learning and neural networks. The difference between deep learning and neural networks is neural networks was the term when, when I was when I was a grad student when this didn't work very well and was talking a lot about brains and things like that. Deep learning is the word for today, and why that's the word where it does seem to work. And one difference is that these networks are now, for technical reasons, much larger than they used to be. So it used to be in, in my day, in the prim days when I, you know, I had a good friend of mine who was studying these at, 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 as, when I was a graduate student, and I, I laughed at him the entire time in grad school, okay, and, and that was fine. You know, and and uh, he ended up went and going into something else because he knew he was wrong. But, uh, but, but with time, um, you know, what ended up happening is as computers got to the point of being able to build bigger and bigger networks, suddenly the performance of these things crossed some kind of threshold where they started doing interesting things. You know, these are models. What's good about these models is that they have a huge number of parameters. So if you can, because each, each one of these edge weights is a parameter, the good thing is if you train, if you set those parameters right, you can build a very, very complicated model. The bad thing is you have to set all those parameters right. The good thing is now from, in a lot of applications, there's huge volumes of training data. So potentially you can meaningfully fit those parameters. And it, as it happens, there are now algorithms and architectures that make it reasonable to fit these things. So. It was a surprise when these things suddenly started working well, but that's, that was probably about four or five years ago. Any questions? So what's the basic principle? The weight of each edge is a parameter, so you can build things that have large parameter sets. Large parameters, you can do one thing. You have a lot of parameters. A lot of parameters mean you can do something meaningful with a large dating training set. Right? Does everybody agree that if you want to fit a linear regression thing, y equals a, some constant times x, and you've got a zillion training points, there's still a limit to how well you can fit that constant, right? You only have one parameter here. You don't need a, a, a billion training examples to fit this. If you do need a billion training examples to fit it, it can't fit it very well, right? So you might as well throw the whole thing out. Okay, but if you've got a lot of parameters, you can use these things. The fact that these networks are deep means that you can build kind of like hierarchical representations of things. The, tr the network is going to learn what it means, but kind of sometimes when you take a look at these inputs, if, you, if this was an image processing thing, maybe here are the pixels coming in from the image. The next layer might sort of be things that kind of ends up recognizing where there are lines or discontinuities. The layer above that might recognize, oh, where there are patches. The line above that might re recognize objects. 
And so you can kind of build, in some sense, hierarchical models, okay, implicitly coming out of the training. And that's a good thing. The other thing is that there now exist toolkits that make it easy to build these kind of models. So it's not like there's some things that when a new idea comes out, a small number of people are smart enough to figure out how to do it. It's clear that this deep learning thing is something everyone and their uncle can figure out, okay, once you have a sufficiently good library. Okay, there's a standard library, the tools, the amount of work it takes to build one of these models is not that complicated. It takes a lot of training data and computation, and maybe that's not what you have. That may be what Google has that you don't have, okay? But this is not rocket science on some level. And how do these things work? Well, what's going to be typically what happens is, again, there's these node form, these, these network formulas. What is going on at one of these nodes? Typically, there is a, you have cer certain edges coming into it. Typically, the, what these nodes will do is compute a weighted sum of the input. So if xi is the ith input, it's coming in on an edge. Uh, we have that edge will have a, a weight, a particular weight that was trained on. Wi is the coefficient value. X sub i is the data value. This will say we're going to compute the sum of, of these uh, weighted sum. And we will add a, um, perhaps a, another constant to it, a coefficient, OK? If we have a, of another constant, we add. This they call the bias, because even if there was no input, this would give you a weight. It's like a preconception of what the value of this function should be. But the important point is that we take the inputs, we compute a weighted sum, and then we compute a nonlinear function of it. This is kind of the other thing that's kind of interesting. That it doesn't just compute weighted sums, but it will compute the weighted sum and then take that weighted sum, that value, and pass it through some kind of a nonlinear function. What is an example? We talked about the logit function in class a lot this year, right? The logit function took a value and mapped it to a probability from 0 to 1, right? You could imagine a logit thing that, that does this, this thing. Okay? That's a nonlinear function of the input. Another thing they use are these ReLU functions. I don't even remember what it stands for. But it's kind of 0 if it's negative, and then linear if it's positive. Okay? Can you see like a decision tree there, like you have a nonlinear line? Well, it's nonlinear, but we need something, a function of one variable. If we were going to be taking the inputs and computing this uh, weighted sum, we are computing, out of this is coming one value. From all the inputs, we get a value. And we're going to do something nonlinear to that value. OK? You may be proposing, oh, let's build some kind of fancy or other thing that took these things and built a decision. But, but again, the, the training is on these weights. OK? We want the training to be on the weights and not on other things. OK? On the edge weights. So why is it that it's important that the, uh, the nodes here have a nonlinear function okay, uh, done to it? You have the idea that, 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 that we could have a, a weighted sum. I think everybody gets the idea of the input. You have edge weights, weighted sum. Why would we have, uh, have to feel a need to pass it through a nonlinear filter instead of just passing on the weighted sum itself? Anybody know? Right. So basically, what it says here is that when you have a function, let's say we just did adding. What happened if we had an adding node here and an adding node here feeding into another layer of adding node? Does everybody see here is a, a, a tree of height two levels doing adding? Here is a same tree, uh, another tree of height one just doing adding. Does everybody see that this tree can be made to do, this does exactly the same thing as the higher depth tree? Do you see that if you're adding four things up, if you add the first pair and then add the second pair and add it together, that's the same effect as adding just four numbers together, 
Right? Does everybody see that? So unless you, you have something nonlinear going on, having greater depth doesn't buy you anything. Does everybody kind of see that? <clears throat> but if you instead have some weird truncation or some weird, suddenly you get complicated nonlinear things. Any questions? And that seems to be necessary to make the thing have network, have, have that thing. How do you find what the parameters of these things are? There is an algorithm called backpropagation that works, you know, in a vague sense, a lot like the stochastic gradient descent algorithms we talked about, where if we want to try to figure out what should the weights of this be, let's say we have a training example that for this input produces an example of should have a, a, a weighted value of 15. Okay, we're doing a regression. We're trying to predict somebody's IQ. And we train on them, and we look at their example, and their real IQ was 107. And now I run this thing, my current network on that, and I get back a prediction of 115. My current network vo voted this guy as smarter than he really was, right? So I've got to find a way to make him dumber. How do I make him dumber? I am probably going to have to figure out which one of these variables contributed most to me thinking of him as being smart, and then probably lowering the, the associated weight there. Does everybody kind of see that? And now I can make it come out closer to what I want it to be. Well, usually you build the network with the function. That's the hardware. The, 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 the thing to be trained is the, um, are the weights of the edges. OK? Any questions about that? And in sort of like a, the same kind of heuristic-y, gradient descent -y kind of idea, we could have a bunch of training examples. Excuse me. Where am I going? Hold on. Sorry. I'm out of control here. Let me get back here. OK? And you know, in general, what, what could I do? I will take an input example. I will see how should I change the weight so that it would have done better on it. I will make those changes at the highest level. I will now propagate this further down. That's probably the difference here that, between this and the kind of gradient descent that we did. But basically, there's a way to adjust the weights. And that's what these training algorithms do. And um, the interesting thing is that. Uh, Unlike our gradient descent thing, this is not a convex optimization problem. So we're not going to eventually learn the absolute best parameters the way we did in our linear regression. But if we have enough examples, it produces a good enough set of weights that it does interesting things on many problems. Any questions? Well, okay. But so, so, well, oh, wait. So, so, I mean, you mean, is this after the whole thing is trained, or in the course of training? So now, at the end, I have a model, and I should evaluate my model, right? And I evaluate it on a different set of training data, and I will either decide I like the performance of it or I don't like the performance of it. Saying, what do I do if I don't like the performance of it? The answer is do something different. Okay. And maybe it's maybe it's maybe I need to design my network differently. Maybe I need to add a layer or take a layer away. Maybe I need to, you know, my training data wasn't good enough. In the case of linear regression, should we just plot the line and see like this is a bit of some noise or like doing like this? We should make some amendments here and there. But in this case, we cannot see it. Well, you're saying just you see the line. The only reason you can see the line typically is because you see it in two dimensions. So you could see the line y equals cx. But if I had a 100-dimensional feature vector, you couldn't see the line in regression either. You can compute an error measure. How close were my predictions to what they really were on my test and evaluation data, and then see whether I'm satisfied with that. So it's not really any different as the other one. You have a model. You evaluate it. If the model isn't good enough, you realize you've got to do something different. Okay. Any questions? OK. What I'd like to talk about is, just to finish up for today, because it is a particularly cool thing that, that, that is warm to my heart, OK, 
is one of the applications of these neural network systems is a technique for doing things called, for producing something called word embeddings. How many people have heard of word to vec What? Well, okay. It's an, anyway, it's a very famous program that, uh, you know, Google people wrote at one point that takes as input text and produces representations of uh, what words mean in some sense. And what it does is, in particular, it, it, it tries to, you, you tell me how many dimensions you want your meaning to be. Typically, I'll say 100 or 64 or 128 or some number of dimensions. And what this thing is going to try to do is for all the words in your document, you, all the words in your vocabulary, if you have a large number of training texts, it is going to try to come up with a representation where each word is represented as a feature vector in 100 dimensions, OK? with the property that two words that do similar things should have similar feature representations. That's kind of what we want to have happen. Well, how is a word broken into features? Without that, it's not at all obvious. If I were to say, what is the meaning of yellow? What is the meaning of yellow? To represent it, it's a color. How would you represent this in a computer, what yellow means? I don't know. You might represent it by saying yellow appears in text next to, um, what you call it, car. You take a little word like car. Yellow appears next to car a lot. Yellow appears next to light a lot. Yellow appears next to the, you know, yellow the. That probably appears very few times, right? So you might imagine you could represent what yellow means by a long vector of how many times it occurs near other words, right? But this is an unwieldy thing to work with, right? Because if there's 50,000 words in a vocabulary, this is a 50,000 dimensional thing, right? We'd like to be able to come up with a smaller number of dimensions that captures what the idea is, right? And what these word to vec things do is very clever. We need training data to see if we have a good representation. What they do is take text and break it up into windows, arbitrary windows. And they ask you to, they try to ask, predict what word, they take a word, sequence of five words appearing in a text, take the middle one out, and have the computer try to guess what that word is. Okay? What word is it? We would blank to improve. You hear try, yes. I hear like, want, okay. We would yellow to improve? Probably not, okay. We would the to improve? Probably not, right? So what, what we try to do is, for every word, learn feature vectors so that we are good at guessing what the missing words are in these kind of fra 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 phrases. Does everybody kind of get that idea? And, you know, we have an infinite number. So long as you have a huge amount of text, any chunk of length five is a perfectly good training instance. Does everybody see that? There's no supervision here that needs to be done, right? It just takes an arbitrary string of text, takes every window of five vertices, and puts itself to learn representations of the word so that it does a pretty good job of guessing what word is missing. OK? Any questions about that? These deep learning things had lots of parameters. We want to learn 100 dimensions for every one of 50,000 words. That's a lot of parameters, right? But if I have a huge amount of training text, OK? I can learn reasonable dimensions to get better and better at answering these things. And what do I know? Like and try probably have similar meanings if they are both answers for that. Is that clear? And with this thing, you can build surprisingly good representations of what words mean. Any questions? Yeah.
Okay. Okay, so where is this like classification? Well, first of all, let's imagine that the world was that there were a vocabulary of 100,000. There are 100,000 choices for this center word, right? We could view this as a classification problem where given we would blank to improve, say this belongs in the try class, okay? Now we've got a problem of how do we learn, you know, basically lear learn to predict the class given this thing, right? And one of the things that it's going to learn are features for every word, okay? That's one of the parameters. The way you set this thing up, just like there's parameters for evaluating this inside, we're going to learn the parameters for what should the representation for we be? What would the parameter for would be? to make it as good as possible at that classification problem. Any questions? Yeah. So the features over here are still like the idea of vicinity, right? Like in the vicinity of that word. So aren't it uh, dimensions would still be some combination of words, right? Each, each dimension. So the way to think about it, we are going to end up assigning every word in the vocabulary a point in a hundred dimensional space. And that point in a hundred dimensional space is we are saying is the meaning of the word. And words that are close to each other in this space probably mean similar things. These were some experiments we did in trying to build these things for many languages. When we trained on a lunch of text, an English text, and we said, what is it near the word Mumbai? Okay, turned out the nearest neighbors were Chennai, Bengal, you know, Cairo, Hyderabad. Okay, are these words that have similar meaning to, to Mumbai? The answer is yes. What words were close to Pope in Italian? Turned out to be other names for popes and, uh, and, and Roman Catholic things like cardinals and friars and priests, right? What's closest to rouge or red in French? Turned out to be other colors in French. Does everybody kind of see this? And it does an amazingly good job of organizing things by uh, what you call it. We can kind of think of this as conceptually we organize all the words in some high space where similar words mean similar things. And these words are now going to be features. If I have a feature for a word like Mumbai, what do I now know? If I want to classify, I can now use this as a thing. And I wanted to say, what cities are Asian? If I have examples of some Asian cities and some non-Asian cities, based on this representation, I would be able to make a guess, right? Okay. And so this is an amazingly useful thing.